All right. Hello, Ning Yu here again. I'm a doctoral student from UNC Chapel Hill School of Information and Library Science, and this is the second lesson in the short course on Basics of Library and Information Science, or LIS. It's a shortened version of undergrad introductory classes in iSchools, schools training information professionals, and here you will learn the basic vocabularies just enough to get you started, while a semester-long class will discuss these topics in more details. So on our agenda today is information theories. What is information, and how do people get information out of physical things, aka documents? In the last lesson, we mentioned how modern information science emerged in the 1950s and 60s as people made more and more paperwork for large-scale collaboration. This was after World War II when populations and economies were on the rise. These changes called for management of people and materials and social engineering followed. People attempted to scientifically measure, analyze, predict, and control human societies. In terms of information, an important paradigm came to the front around this time, the conduit metaphor. Looking back on this time period, information scholar Ronald Day noticed this pattern in languages and in people's thinking, that information is some abstract, immaterial content, while whatever carries or contains that information is a meaningfully, purely material container. Because content and container are two separate things, like water in a cup, you can easily swap out the container without hurting the content at all. According to Day, this is the way people imagined what information is. You can think of this conduit metaphor as a way of thinking, a mindset, or a philosophy. But it is also an actual metaphor used a lot in every language back then and still today. In fact, this kind of metaphor is not new at all. We can date it all the way back to Plato's philosophies that the material reality is nothing but imperfect realizations of perfect ideal concepts. It also compares to dualism, the belief that human minds or spirits are something separate from our physical body. And as good as this dualist ideal may sound, I believe otherwise. As I mentioned before, all of this thinking came around in the modern time. You probably have also heard of the word postmodern. So modern thinking or modernism, to put it very, very roughly, is a highly structural, hierarchical way of thinking. And it builds very much upon enlightenment philosophies. This way of thinking believes that purely objective realities exist, and it assumes that we, as these ideal, rational, body-independent human minds, can simply go out, explore the realities, and draw information right out of them. Postmodern thinking, or postmodernism, on the other hand, believes that everything exists only in its material reality, and everything is closely connected to each other. So you cannot change one without changing another. In that sense, human minds are just functions of very real, very physical human bodies. There's no perfect ideal concepts out there. We're all living in this ocean of interconnected materials. And when it comes to information, we can no longer separate information from physical things or from people who perceive that information. The feeling that we as human subjects are getting information from things, it is just because our bodies are interacting with these things. And it's also because we live in this entire network of humans and non-humans, so we all get influences from each other. If you're like, oh, some of these postmodern statements sound pretty familiar, it's probably because we are actually living in this time. Postmodernism in, is in a lot of prominent thoughts that are slowly becoming common sense today. This can range from quantum mechanics, which believes observations change observed results, to feminist and queer theories, which makes us aware of our living physical bodies and emotional labors. It's in actor network theory in contemporary sociology, which analyzes webs of relations among many different human and non-human factors, and it's in decolonization and anti-racism practices, which respect multiple ways of knowing and multiple narratives of the history. The study of documents is not a new field, Instead, it's almost as old as the modern library and archive professions. Back in the early 20th century, Susan Bray, a French librarian, historian, and author, was already pondering the nature of the document. A bit earlier than Bray, Paul Olay, a Belgian author and entrepreneur, was also imagining documentation systems that work like hypertext web page today. 
One of the key ideas from Susan Bray is that documents and their information are not limited to the obvious ones. Not only paperwork are the documents, but per Bray, anything can be a document. For example, an antelope kept in a zoo is itself a document, a specimen captured for humans to study and get the information out of. This field of study went out of fashion during the early years of information science, partly due to the conduit metaphor. If the physical document was only a container, then obviously it couldn't be interesting to study. Instead, early information science focused on the process of gaining and exchanging information and the logical structure of gained knowledge. In 1990s and 2000s, as postmodernism grew more interest, a new document studies emerged in information science. Building on the earlier works, this is called the new documentalist tradition. And it began with scholars like Michael Buckland and Neil Swinfield Lund. Their works tried to build more analytical frames that allow people to study the many aspects of documents, like material states, mental impacts, cultural codes, social relations, and so on. Over time, scholars develop more detailed frameworks, and these works are now sometimes put together under the title Document Phenomenology, i.e. studies of the human phenomenon of understanding something as a document. Here's one recent example. In 2016, Tom Grishness and Kirsten Lanson developed a holistic framework to examine how we perceive documents. They broke the perception of documents into two parts, the human and the thing and they further broke the human and the thing each into two, their internal states and their external relations. So for example, imagine someday when you're walking, you came across a metal tree grid on the side of the road, and you notice it's made in a pretty broke style. At that point, you are reading the grid as a document and getting information out of it. How does this process happen? Well, we can break it down. On the thing side, the grid itself is made in a certain shape, and that certain shape is its internal state, called intrinsic information. It must also have gone through design, manufacture, transportation, and installation processes. So these external relations are its extrinsic information. And when you approach the grid, you yourself may be in a certain internal mental and physical state. Say you are feeling particular stylish that day, and that makes you more sensitive to the grid's design. That is your abstrinsic information. And finally, you also have the memories from, say, an art history class, and that external relation helps you recognize the great style, that is, your extrinsic information. These different kinds of information came together in that moment you saw the great, and now you can see the metal great as a meaningful thing. In the historical overview before, I have been badmouthing a little bit about modernism, so let's be fair. Postmodernism and modernism are both just tools for your thoughts. My personal beliefs aside, there is nothing inherently better or worse about these isms. Besides, we are living today with lots of modern thoughts and modernist systems in our lives. As information scholar Karen Trace argues, it's useful to see things in both modern and postmodern lenses. According to Trace, the postmodern view shows us how lateral relations construct things while the modern view shows us how things can still have internal logics and hierarchies. So what can we get from modernist view on information? Here are the two major frameworks. The first modern theory we will cover here is representation theory. If you have ever learned to analyze arts, let it be literature analysis, art theory, rhetorics, or film studies, you have done analyzing representations. In fact, data itself is a kind of representation too. They are things that stand in for something else. The theory in humanities and literature studies come from linguistics, more precisely, semiotics. Semiotics studies how people make meanings, and while this is a field rooted in modern times, it is still very relevant today. This is what we are borrowing from semiotics, how people make meanings out of signifying relations or signs. According to the two founding theories in semiotics, signifying relations happen between two or three parties. And here I will focus on the two-fold version. This is because it's more common in other humanities, arts, and literature fields, and personally I find it a little bit more solid on the philosophical ground. According to Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, the signifying relation exists between the signifier and the signified. The signifier 
is a representation or expression, a thing that stands in for something else, and the signified is that something else. So for example, the video you're watching right now shows a visual image of me, and a person with vision can perceive that image. This video of me is a signifier. On the other hand, as you watch the video, you are probably imagining me not as pixels on your screen, but a full person talking to you. That mental reaction of yours, the feeling that you're watching a person, is a signified. It is signified by that video image. This relation can go even further, with signs nested within signs. So for instance, if you see the word red, and you think of the color, the word you see is a signifier, and the color you think of is a signified. But if you think further, the color red can also make you think of other things, like vitality, anger, happiness, violence, fortune, etc. In that case, the idea of the color red itself becomes a signifier, while your further reaction to that color is a signified. When you analyze an artwork or a text, these nested signs can go on and on while you dig deeper and deeper into the meanings and implications behind the works. And just to quickly give you a sense of the other core framework of semiotics, the threefold version coming from American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. Peirce's word for signifier is roughly representation, the thing that represents something else. For signify, his word is interpretant, or the mental interpretation you have in reaction to the representation. Peirce further believes there's a third external object that the signifier points to. So for example, I am a real person, and I'm the object of this video you are watching. In this case, obviously the real me is different from both the video image of me and your mental image of me. But if we think further, this object position is a bit wobbly. Can I, the real person, exist without all the impressions and influences I make? Or are these relations around me the true essence of my existence? Even without going that far in philosophy, for inherently abstract things like color red, what exactly is an object? Or is there an object at all? Now let's go one more step into the science, this time into the formal representations themselves. And here we will find another modern theory of information. This theory comes from Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver, both American mathematicians. They recognize that information has many layers, from the physical documents to the meanings of science but they hope to focus on the both basic level, the quantified amount of differences and patterns. A bit of a recall, 1950s information science had this relation with wartime communication engineering. This is where Shannon and Weaver were working. They were trying to quantify the amount of information so that engineers can have a clearer idea of how capable their communication systems need to be. So for instance, if you know the current communication channel, will drop about 30% of signals on an average day. You can repeat every message once and you will have a good chance that most of your messages will come through even with the drops. The problem is, how do you get that number in the first place? Shannon and Weaver set this up in a very limited mechanical world. When you type on a machine, for example, you only have this many letters, numbers, and punctuations to choose from. And you can only type these many symbols on a given space. So if you have ever learned about statistics, probability, or discrete math, you know you can now calculate how many different combinations you can have. Let's take a simple example. Say you have a four-digit combination lock. Each digit can be between 0 and 9. So in total, how many different passcodes can you make? Well, you have 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. That is 10 to the power of 4, or 10,000 combinations. That is all the numbers between 0000 all the way to 9999. So the same idea applies to English alphabets and really all, any other symbol sets. Let's look at Wordle for example, the word guessing game. And here you have 5 spaces for each try, and for each space, you can choose from 26 English letters. Then for each try, you have a maximum capacity of 26 times 26 times 26 times 26 times 26, times 26 combination. That is 26 to the power of 5, or roughly 12 million different combinations. As you can see, because combinations work exponentially, the number grows extremely fast. Here, Shannon and Weaver further invented a way to bring down that exponential growth, to take the logarithm. Logarithm is the opposite of exponential operations, 
If you take log base 2 of 8, for example, you have 3, because 2 times 2 times 2, or 2 to the power of 3, is 8. If it's log base 2 of 1024, then the answer is 10, because 2 to the power of 10 is 1024. Even as the exponential calculations grow extremely fast, logarithm will always bring it down. And this log base 2 calculation is exactly how Shannon and Weaver define information capacity in bits. Yes, that is the bits that we see today in digital computers. 8 bits make 1 byte, and 1000 or 1024 bytes make 1 kilobyte, or KB. Same for megabyte or MB, gigabyte or GB, or terabyte or TB. So for the combination log with 10,000 combinations, the log base 2 will give you between 13 to 14 bits, and we always round up to contain all the possibilities, so it's 14 bits. Um, for the roughly 12 million combinations of Wordle, you will have between 23 to 24 bits, and we round it up to 24 bits. That is only 3 bytes. This greatly shortens the number, and if you think of how many combinations there are behind 1 KB, it's pretty wild. This base 2 logarithm also works extremely well for digital computers based on binary circuits. Instead of coding every possible symbol into the machine, the machine now only needs to handle two cases, 0 and 1, on and off, connected and disconnected. Okay, so I know that has been a lot. In this lesson, we reviewed the history of modern and postmodern information theories. They went from physical documents in complex human non human relations, all the way down to signs, symbols, and bits. Big or small, material or abstract, these are all components that make documents meaningful and make information flow. They allow us to create machines, share thoughts, collaborate with each other, and make the world run. Each theory has its own focus and limit, and each is useful in its own way. Imperfect as they are, these are the fundamental theories of information. In the next lesson, we will move from these very abstract theories to some actual techniques that people use in libraries and databases. We will also talk about how people design and evaluate information retrieval systems, often seen today as searches. So that will conclude our lesson. I will see you next time, and until then, stay informed and stay well. Peace!